Hello, so this is the Berserk QA quality analysis, which is actually a, uh, a QA that I've been planning to do for a while. Uh, well, the original idea was to do a character analysis on Griffith specifically, but at this point I decided to just stretch that into um, a general QA. Um, my issue with Berserk was that, you know, originally when I first watched it, experienced it, I... Uh, I was like mildly depressed for like a week because of what happened during the eclipse. Uh, you could accuse me of being over dramatic. Art sometimes has that effect on me. Um, but I knew even then that's like, okay, eventually I have to talk about the show. At the very least, I have to talk about this Griffith character. So that's what a lot of this is going to be. Uh, but I also just want to sort of go over the, the show in general. Just to get into it. Um, the way I first came across Berserk, and I, I've, I'd only heard things, it's like it's super violent, super gory, it's this ultra visceral, ultra gore fest uh, anime manga thing. So I'm like, okay. And I'm actually kind of drawn to that stuff. I usually, just, just sort of like a morbid curiosity. I don't enjoy it. You know, I don't enjoy it, but I'm just curious. It's like, okay, is it, if it's bad, how bad is it? You know, is it worse than what I'm imagining in my head? Because what I can imagine in my head can be pretty damn bad. So that's what that that sort of morbid curiosity is what uh, lured me into it. The first thing I did was I watched a gore montage of the gore in Berserk on YouTube, and uh, that was pleasant. <laughs> and so, and I was just like, I was really mesmerized by. It. I'm like, well, why is why are all these people? What's all these like giant creepy mouths eating people? I didn't understand what the hell was going on. Then I actually decided to look into the 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 thing. So I watched the show, and then I read the manga. And um, that's essentially where we're at, uh, and and that's when you know the whole thing, the the the, the mis I was mesmerized by the, uh, the 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 general sort of theme of it, the this like this 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 very uh, mythical uh, mytholog mythological fate, you know you know ultra power thing that's going on. It's very sort of spiritual with uh, within Berserk, the idea of like the God Hand and the apostles and you know, all that stuff. So I was really drawn by that kind of mythos. And um, it's it's really, like, interesting to just wonder about. But I also want to get, I also want to just mention now specifically that when I eventually get to Griffith in this video, um, I want to also talk about that at a level of ethics because I think there's a lot to talk about with regards to Griffith specifically and the solar ecl the eclipse and and the whole the way that everything turned out from an ethicist's perspective right so so as we get into berserk in general i want to make a brief note about sort of the the way that dark fantasy or just like dark very very sort of like you know stories that emphasize um you know badness in some way brutality you know violence uh death Etc. Etc. Berserk is obviously one of those. It has that in spades. There's a way to do that well, and there's a way to not do that well. Obviously, when it comes to like character death, you can't just have characters dying nonstop because then there's no way to, you, you, there's no reason to be connected with any of the characters, right? Now, Berserk does not do this, right? With the central cast, it's actually tre it, it treats the central cast like they're really important, and they are, and that's good. The story is supposed to do that to an extent, because that way when they do die, it's, if they die, it's very effective. And the, soul, the eclipse was very effective, in the same way that you know, character deaths in Game of Thrones are effective, etc. Um, the, the problem with Berserk, and I'm going to sort of, I, I want to also criticize the show, because there are things about it that are like, actually the, the manga, whatever, the, the thing, because there's, 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 there's elements of it that are like, not very good. Um, it's not. <clears throat> I, I'm not enamored by it as some like the, you know, uh, serious diehard fans are. It's not the greatest thing ever written or or thought of. Um, I'll get into why. Right. So th the issue is like with the main characters, the story treats them very um, faith. It's very faithful to them and their struggle. It's not faithful whatsoever towards the setting as a whole. The setting is incredibly cartoony. And it's just sort of like, it's sort of like, who gives a shit? Like, who cares about this setting? It's impossible to care about, it's, it's hard to care about the setting when the setting is so freaking bad. When it's as bad as it is in Berserk. 
You know, it, it's like, and this this starts out very early on, and like the first few chapters of the manga, you know, you have guts, and he's walking around through some town, and on like page three, he just starts, he just starts murdering people, and it's like. Okay, why do I care about what's happening in this... Do I care about what's happening in this world? Not not really. You know? And it it's bad. There's there's cannibalism. You know, there's people being killed and tortured and beheaded all the time. There's, you know, the 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 trolls and the, the children killing one another. I mean, it's just... Ugh. The thing about, like, having something that's, that's all the, thematically... Um, obsessed with just showing you badness and, and evil and horror is that um, if it's constantly happening it you get numb to it and it, it stop like it I, I can't just keep caring about it like I can understand maybe the story wants me to keep caring about it but I force myself not to because I realize it's sort of just a trick right I, I'm not constantly going to be you know, horrified by horror if there's nothing but horror. That's why, you know, that, that kind of violent stuff, it needs to be used sort of sparingly, you know, with, with restraint. That being said, though, I do have to compliment Berserk because Berserk does keep finding new ways to be horrifying in, in ways you couldn't even imagine. I mean, again, the, think about the trolls and the, you know, just, 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 just everything in it, the random goat deity thing. There's, there's all this stuff, especially in the post-Eclipse uh, post stuff, so it it's very um, I, you can give it props for that. It does it's very creative with just how you know horrifying it is, but at the same time, you know, you you can't bring yourself to, to possibly care about that kind of setting, right? Um, it's more it's like it's even a deeper philosophical thing because if the setting is always bad and the setting can't be be any better, if there's no sense that the setting can improve in some way. Why should I care? Why should you care? Why should anyone care? Right? The whole idea of, of badness is it's significant if you can tell that there is a way for things to be better, but they don't get better. Right? Like things could get better, but we keep losing and failing. That would have more significance in the same way that if the setting was doing well and things were happy and people were good and flourishing and everything was lovely, but there was a sense of danger. Like, there was a sense that that needed to be earned or, or secured or kept safe in some way. That would have more impact, right? Because then there's a sense that it's not just a given. And Berserk is like that on the negative end. It's like the badness of the setting is just a given. There's nothing you can really do about it. And so there's nothing to be gained in the world overall. Now you could argue about Fantasia and say that, no, no, no. You know, or Falconia rather. And look at Falconia. Falconia is is good, so so something does change. But this is one of the things I kind of not want to criticize Falconia. Um, point number one: I don't trust Falconia. Um, the the idea that it's this good place, it, it's stuff like yeah, I understand that's what it's supposed to be. But okay, there's two reasons I don't like Falconia. Um, reason number one is there's no real like obvious logic to it, based on what. Uh, like we've seen it's just just magic like it's just magically perfect for no good reason you know and griffith is in control and i'm not a fan of griffith at this point obviously i don't think anyone is so so that in and of itself doesn't bode well i mean griffith has proven himself not to be a reliable human being who gives a shit about other people's lives so you know why should you and like it, the other thing about it is that falconia is just so arbitrary like what how is it actually being kept alive where is it getting resources do you know who's working it's like you can't just pull you know some sort of utopia out of your ass and expect me to believe that it's there you could i mean you could justify it by explaining it right but you have to explain it right and explaining it is is not easy especially in a world that's this bad how something like falconia could even exist how it could be maintained, and how the, the monsters and everyone's just happy and actually believes in this place. Just like that, that is very, very hard to justify in a world that's this bad. That kind of thing has to be earned, and the setting just goes along and just flips a switch, and then suddenly you have this utopia. It's not, it's just, it, it, that's like, that's lazy storytelling for the most part. I, at the end, I, I sort of, like, I sort of get it at the same time, because... It, Berserk as a, as a narrative isn't too concerned with what makes sense in the setting. Like I said, the setting is just, it's just meant to like feel awful for the journey of the main character to, 
to resonate. And the journey of the main character does resonate, right? But, you know, I, I can't, you can't just ignore the setting when this is, it's still a point, it still goes as a point against Berserk as a whole. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the whole thing with Falconia, it's like, the, the nature of the setting in Berserk is like, this is usually a thing throughout all anime, is that, you know, anime, it, it tries to, anime very often tries to create these, like, high-stakes situation with this fights and battles and everything's important, but it doesn't actually earn any of that because it doesn't focus on the logic or, or the, the structure that's required for that stuff to actually make sense and manifest in the world, you know. If Falconia is this awesome, great place, I should be happy that it exists, right, but, but I, I'm not because I don't trust it because you didn't actually ex do enough of job to explain how it works, you know. And if the world of Berserk in general is such a bad place, you didn't really do enough work to justify that, right? Like, how exactly is there even civilization? Like, again, it's, it, if you think about the world of Berserk for a second, it's hard to even imagine how civilization could even exist in this world, considering how um, human beings suck and they can't do anything. And literally everywhere you go, there's some horrible monster that can totally destroy them and only, like, some superhuman, like, guts can do anything about it. So... You know, it's it's hard to even explain how how, how humanity can, can flourish whatsoever. Um, yeah, next thing you have, like, this, it's, it also gets into, like, characters like Puck and all these, like, innocent beings that surround Guts. It's like, how are you, how are these people even alive, right? They would have been killed ten times over in a setting that's this harsh, right? And it's sort of like, and again, it's it's, it's bipolar because, because on the one hand, I kind of like Puck's interactions with Guts. Puck is sort of funny, and it's like, and Guts is super serious and sad, and there's a bit of a, there's a bit of a chemistry there, but at the same time, it detracts from the story because it seems so cartoony. Here's Guts, who just murdered, like, ten people, and he pulled someone's, you know, head off, and then Puck is like, oh, Guts, why are you being so mean? And I'm like, what? <laughs> and Puck is just waving his arms around like a little fairy, and, and you know, like a like an animu fairy, and I'm like, what the fuck is this weeb shit that I'm watching right now, right? Like, this this is not... How am I meant to take this seriously, right? On the one hand, I could, it's like, am I supposed to feel like, holy shit, Guts is killing people, it's horrible, it's awful, it's, ooh, it's serious, but then it, it pulls, you know, Puck, Puck comes in, and he's this cartoon character, right? It, it, those two, those two elements clash, they all, no matter what. So, actually, that's part of the reason why I haven't really... I actually want to admit is like I, I at a certain point as I was going through the manga I just stopped taking it seriously and I stopped um, reading I was just flipping through it and just like reading occasional lines just to see the general gist of it um, my overall thing is like as a narrative I don't think Berserk is that interesting because it, it has so many like you know it, it has so many superficial elements like that it's, it's a thing throughout all of anime I'm going to get to the good stuff about Berserk in a, in a sec, I swear. But I'm just, I want to emphasize the bad, because the bad is really, it's really there. You know, this is why a lot of people, you could just look at Berserk and be like, oh, okay, who cares? You know, it's it's just, it's not, it, it, there's a level at which it's not worth, you know, any real consideration. Because it's just, it's, it's cartoon gore porn at a certain point. Uh, so, yeah, there's that. Now, um... Now let's talk about the good stuff. Thematically, Berserk is interesting. So, I, you know, I say I don't care about the setting. I sort of, like, I, I sort of, I don't really care about the setting because I don't think the setting makes sense or ever made sense. And it's just, it's clear that they're flipping the rules with that as they like. Um, you know, everything was horrible, but then there's, you know, then we created Fantasia. And it's like, okay, if the setting can just change like that, what even, what even is what even are the rules anymore it's you know but i what i what i will say is i i do care about the actual story with regards to the main characters and how you know how how their narratives are going to play out um specifically you know guts casca griffith and you know the general you know the the, the main people in the party and the some of the apostles and, and the god hand obviously um i'm really fascinated by this whole idea of evil thing it's it's well actually I'll talk about the idea of evil uh, later, but yeah the the narrative is is just very interesting. Now what, one thing I will say is that what's what's interesting about it is I can't 
for for tell for see any real. I don't see where the story is going to go, which could be a good thing, which is a good thing in a way because I'm I'm sort of it it makes things kind of exciting. You know, I want to see what happens. Obviously, you know, there's some the conflict between Guts and Griffith needs to be resolved in some way, but how it's going to be resolved, I have no idea, right? It could be resolved, in, you know, in a way where, like, a lot of people have predicted that, you know, because of the brand, that Guts and Cask are doomed to have their souls fucking liquefied in the abyss. But I could also see the story, because the story doesn't, you know, have strict uh, rules within the world, I could also see Guts just saying, no, fuck that, and just, you know, killing everything, and then killing the idea of evil, and then just saying, no, you know, I decide my own fate. It, it could go either way, I have no idea. Um, it could go whatever way, like, I, at least as far as what I've seen, I don't see any obvious direction in with, which it's necessarily going to go. Um, there's a sort of a wide plethora of ways that the narrative could play out. Um, so that, that in itself is a good thing. It could also be a bad thing, because it, it might also mean that the setting will just, you know... Sometimes when this happens in fiction, it's, it's because the, the writers don't have... The writer doesn't have a very strict... Um, solid plan that makes sense because if there was a plan that did make sense you'd be able to sort of foresee what the ending would be right this happened in the mass effect 3 situation which is why you know, the, the, that ending didn't turn out so well either right so it, it might happen here as well i don't know it's, it's very hard to to you know foresee foretell what how the narrative is going to play out um and whether or not the the narr the, the way it plays out will have any kind of thematic resonance right so, um, let's get into the, the, the themes, I guess, the, the themes, the, the world. Like I said before, there's this strong, like, mythos within Berserk. Um, the, 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 the narrative is carried by the mythos in large part. This, the idea of fate, um, the idea of having a dream and following it and self-actualizing, the idea of the, the idea of, of right and wrong and how, like, how, every, a lot, how a lot of things are just sort of getting flipped, right? That's why I want to bring up ethics, because if you look at this from the direction, from, from perspective of, like, what is ethical and what is right, Berserk all, is almost, like, criticizing the very idea of that. Because as soon as you walk into this story, if you, the, at, at first, things, are sort of make, things sort of make sense. You know, you're, you're grounded enough. There's, a, there's more of a sense of right, or, right and wrong than there is later on. Then, after the eclipse happens and everything after that, there's really no sense of right and wrong anymore, right? Like, it's, it's like if you think about ethics as like a moral compass, your moral compass just, just goes fucking haywire uh, at a certain point in the story. And it, it stops pointing any solid direction, I'd say. It's, well, I mean, it sort of still does, but it's like it's very confusing it's it's like you entered it's like you know you have a compass and you entered some fucking magnetic shitstorm and this is what's happening right because you have guts right and guts is not a good person i i want to speak, i want to talk about i mean i want to talk about guts in in more detail a bit later but he's not like he he murders so many people that are probably innocent you know just random soldiers um he just to, to sort of have his way he doesn't let anybody get in his way no matter how, even if those people were innocent, you know, he's not exactly a good guy, and he doesn't look like a good guy, and he's very much, you know, shrouded in darkness and chaotic and vengeful. And that's usually, you know, Guts could easily be a villain in some other story, right? But he's not. And Griffith could easily be the hero. So that's one of the things. And, and they replace it, you know, they make... Um, Griffith is dressed in white, and he's this angelic being, but he's actually pure fucking evil. And Guts is this demonic being, but Guts is actually has... There's something more pure about his journey. Um, it also, it flips, the, the, the flippingness uh, of everything, it, this is why the compass is going crazy, because the story constantly tries to flip things, right? It's also true with, with like, the God Hand, right? Because they're, the God Hand and the Apostles, they're demonic entities, right? They're demons, but they call themselves angels, right? They talk about themselves as if they're angels, and they're servants of God, and then you have the Apostles, who are, well, apostles, but they're all like, they're, they're all, all of them, they're supposed to be these angelic heavenly things, but they're the opposite, right? And then you have the idea of evil itself, which is supposed to be God itself, except the idea of evil is like, everything is backwards with the idea of evil, 
right? The idea of evil, I, I don't know, again, I know that the, that the idea of evil stuff isn't technically canon or whatever, but let's just examine it anyway, right? The idea of evil explains to Griffith that what it's doing is it's provide humanity it's created it you know it, it was created from like the collective desires of all mankind and now it's fulfilling you know its role it's it's desired um it, its function was born out of the collective desires and the collective desire was to what to have to to have demons kill everyone and torture everyone it right what was the point but it, it's very bizarre right if this god this idea of evil god is acting from the collective desires of everyone why is what it like what it's seemingly doing is creating apostles and doing having eclipses you know and perpetuating these um giving all this power these bailiffs giving all these power to all these beings who um you know are, are not doing good things and and they're throwing their humanity away you know to become apostles and they're just doing horrible fucking shit and they're responsible for all of, a lot of the hor not all of it but a lot of the the terrible shit that you see in the world how is that desired it's very fucking strange i i don't actually understand like what the point of that is and maybe it maybe this is something i i haven't um i've misread or or misinterpreted but maybe this is something that eventually gets explained but it's like it's so weird how all of that stuff which is to any like normal thinking person you look at that and it's like oh that's bad all of that is bad but then the idea you comes in and says no 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 this is what's desired and i'm like what this isn't my whole thing with the compass it's going fucking haywire what am i supposed to believe right so at the at the same time it's a little contrived because remember the idea of evil is sort of like responsible for everything that's happening in the setting and the way it accomplishes that is is just you know pure magic it's it's infinitely powerful and it's creating these bailiffs and it's somehow making all these calculations to make sure that uh, the bailiffs get in the hands of the of the people that it has selected and those people are brought into a state where the bailiff is going to um, they're going to be given a choice with the bailiff and they're going to make the choice the the you know the choice that the idea of evil wants them to make you know and their fate is to become servants of darkness because that's what's desired you know and it's it's very strange you could maybe make the argument that all the, the idea of evil was doing was to to justify the creation of falconia because that's falconia is supposed to be the, the one true utopia but but even that is is so again the, the idea that that's flimsy and i'd say because falconia itself is flimsy so yeah there's like this is why i'm saying it's like there's no real it's not a sense of what the rules are that's why i don't know where the story is really going to go um so yeah but the, but that, that's like a, one interesting point about thematicism there's also this idea of fate and how characters are trying to uh challenge their fate and battle their fate and uh, this is a very common very sort of I mean, what's more interesting to me is this idea of, of how the moral compass goes haywire um, than the idea of, of fate and characters like Guts trying to battle against it. Whereas characters like Griffith are, what, essentially consumed by their fate. It, see, it's very weird when you start to think that fate in this setting is what's defined by the idea of evil, and the idea of evil essentially arbitrarily picks what the fate ha gets to be. So, <clears throat> um, there's a certain reason, it's like, the, I, guess, I guess that creates a legitimate reason for any character in the setting to be, to really distrust fate, if fate is, you know, whatever is determined by this, this thing, this being of, of infinite power and wisdom or whatever. So I want to talk about Guts. Guts is... So I want to say Guts is essentially Guts is pretty much the perfect protagonist for this setting. Um, I I said this like again I'm I'm being bipolar with it because I said the main characters are treated very very faithfully and very well. I think um, Guts really works with the setting because obviously in a setting like this, characters like Guts are the only ones who would be able to do anything. They're the only ones who would survive, and they're the only ones who are really, ever really empowered. Everybody else is always, you know, on the brink of destruction or death or turning into, you know, a, a demon. So, it makes Guts perfect. 
Um, the other thing about it, and <laughs> this is what's good, is that th because of Guts's backstory, he's actually way more relatable than you would expect him to be. Um, during the first few chapters of Berserk, you meet Guts, and he's comp he's just an asshole. Like he's he's straight up an asshole, and usually those kinds of characters don't come across very well. You know, you don't you don't tend to like them. A story will eventually try to make them feel sympathetic and, and give you like the backstory, like oh, you know, his parents were killed, blah, 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 blah. and it's usually shallow and and you know very 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 stereotypical, and you just you just get bored. The, the The trope of characters like Guts has been done very very many times. But it works here. It works here because when you find out what ended up happening to Guts, you are like completely on his side. Usually, I, you don't, I don't end up really liking characters like Guts. And I would think a lot of people don't. They're very antisocial. Very antisocial. It's very easy not to relate to them. And you could usually guess it's like, okay, bad shit has happened to them. But it's not, it's not so relatable that you can look at it and be like, oh, I really am on this guy's side. But here, it actually works. For one reason, and one of the reasons why is because the story really goes into detail about what ended up happening to Guts. First of all, him, him being antisocial was sort of true from the beginning, right? He was always kind of a loner. You know, he didn't really have any friends. He, all he did was kill people mercilessly. He was a mercenary, right? So, so that part is sort of there. But, you know, he was less of an asshole for sure. He's a huge asshole post-Eclipse, right? And that part is explained very well because you're not just, you know, you're not just, um, you're not just, something bad didn't just happen. There was a whole narrative there of, of like, things were going and things were kind of going and, and Guts was almost ready to become, almost about to become an, a genuinely good, almost a decent person. He wanted to, you know, pursue his dream, you know, and he was being, you know, nice and compassionate and he was about to become the leader of the Band of the Hawks. And then the eclipse happened. And then he became a very antisocial, very angry, brooding, hateful person. And why the fuck wouldn't he? And I just love it. And everyone loves it. Because you're all, you're on his side like that. As soon as the eclipse happened, you get it. I mean, a betrayal like that. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't, um, you don't stay normal after shit like that happens. Right? Imagine, um... Imagine you're generally a you know distrustful person, and then somebody comes along and they make you trust them, you know, and they think, oh, this person's never going to betray me. This person's amazing. They're great. They're going to lead us to a, you know a better future, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then they commit the worst betrayal. What does that do to your confidence in others, right? So it, the way guts works makes so much sense, and it's also great because. It also makes sense because because of that character, Guts is the only one in the setting who can really do anything about the evil that's in it. He's the only one who can resist. Everybody else is either too weak or too naive or too stupid or just straight up too attached. But Guts, he doesn't give a shit. He doesn't give a fuck about anything that's established. All he cares about is having vengeance. And that makes him the perfect um, protagonist of actually dealing with the horrors that you know permeate the Berserk setting. So it's actually amazing. Um... And, you know, and the other characters, if that's why you know, I actually, like, part of what I, I buy into and what makes sense is that so many characters, when they actually find out the truth, they find out that, holy shit, you know, the Holy See is infested with apostles, there's apostles there, they're, they're eating people, etc. They end up following Guts because he's the only one who seems to, you know, be aware of it and is doing something about it, even though he doesn't care about, you know, the normal lives he kills, but he's... It, it makes so much sense that when they're exposed to the horror, they find safety in him, you know, rather than the world that they're used to. It's very, it's a very, like, interesting dynamic. And this is what I'm saying. It's like Guts is, Guts is like one of the most antisocial characters ever. And yet he's so easy to empathize with and, and be on his side. Everybody who watches the show is on Guts' side, more or less. Right? You love Guts. You have to love Guts. How can, why, how can't you love Guts? I mean, at first, during the Golden Age, he's just sort of mad. But eventually, it's like, wow, this this guy, you know, you're really on board with him the, the, you know, the entire way. And so I'm always amused when I see a comment where, where someone is like, I, I hope Guts, you know, rips Griffith into pieces or something. It, you know, 
And the other thing that's good is, is Guts is not, like, he, he's OP, but he's not, like, he nev it's not that he never has to struggle. He really, uh, a lot of these Apostles almost kick his ass many times, and he really has to pull things out of his ass to try and defeat them. So, the action's really good. That, that's something, uh, the, thing. the action in, in Berserk is certainly very commendable, especially post-Eclipse. Pre-Eclipse, it's whatever, but, but post-Eclipse stuff... You know, the way he fights the, the slug baron, um, the, the, the angel guys, the, the, and of course the, the berserk, when he gets the berserk armor, all that stuff. It's very interesting. It's, it's, very, um, in, it's very engaging. As typical anime fighting is, a lot of the time it is. So, so that, that part's there. That's good. Um, so now I want to talk about Griffith. That's sort of my whole opinion on the show as a whole. Um, like I said, I have not much else to say. I don't take it just to just to sort of summarize. I don't take Berserk setting too seriously, and I'm not taking the message of the show too seriously because there are cartoony, unrealistic elements, you know, that that take away from it. You know, where, where that sort of the, the a lot of the pathos isn't justified when the logos is missing, right? And that's how a lot a lot of anime does that, unfortunately, and, and Berserk is no exception. But that being said, what is exceptional is that the way these characters actually work and, and the struggle that they've, they've had to deal with, you know, th that makes Berserk very unique and very engaging. And it's actually pathetic. If you, if you compare, like, a lot of other fiction and you have some brooding character and their backstories, like, oh, you know, somebody, I was bullied in high school or whatever, and it's such, it's such pathetic, it doesn't even compare to what Guts went through. You know, what Guts went through, this, you know, this is a... You know, this is a real fucking backstory here. You know, this is the shit that'll make you, you know, a psychotic, murderous, antisocial asshole like Guts. Like, holy shit. Um, there's also something very weirdly, like, there's, there's some very weird, like, something very gendered about the way the story goes along. Guts is, like, ultra-masculine. And, um, the characters he protects are usually, like, ultra-feminine. Um... Although, I mean, Casca also has agency and stuff, so, so there is stuff like that. I don't know. It's, it, it's, it's, it's just sort of there. I guess it's not examined. Whatever. Um, it's not a big thing. I want to talk about Griffith. So, I think, um, I should have probably mentioned this earlier, but, but if, if someone, if you're recommending someone to Berserk, it, it, I would honestly recommend that they watch the original anime first, the 1990s anime, the, the, or the, the, the movies that that came out recently um not the new show the new show looks like crap but um the anything any part of the story where they don't spoil the eclipse right at the beginning because for for whatever reason the manga spoils it on like page five okay not page five they spoil it when they introduce the god hand during the slug baron fight and then they remind you many times throughout the golden age it's like hey something Something special about this Griffith guy. Something bad's gonna happen. You know, it, <laughs> it. They beat you over the head with it. You know exactly what's going to happen because you know exactly the nature of the bailout deal, right? I don't know why they do. I don't know why the author chose to do that. The the eclipse is so much more effective if you don't see it coming, right? It's so much more effective if you just. Like, if you just know that there's something in the setting that's that's mysterious and magical and there's the potential for this kind of, like, crazy demons to come out of nowhere, but you don't have anything specific indicating that it will, right? Right? Because the eclipse would need to seem believable, like it could happen in this kind of setting, but without actually being sort of exposed, right? Because knowing that it's going to happen... I, not knowing that it's going to happen really elevates the pathos of, of that scene. Um, it's, whew, I, I want to talk, like, I have nothing but praise for, for the entire Eclipse arc. Like, other than the, 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 the fact that it was spoiled. It's so well constructed. It's so, it's, it's so, the Logos is actually there. This is what I meant earlier before. Like, when there's bad things happening in the setting, they need to be justified. But the Eclipse, that was justified. It didn't just happen. Right? A lot of events took place in order to get us there. Right, Very many things needed to happen to get Griffith and Guts and all these characters where they needed to be. You know, it, Especially Griffith. To get Griffith where he needed to be to make the choice that he made for the Eclipse to end up happening. And that's what makes that moment so much more powerful. On top of the fact that you don't necessarily see it coming. 
right? Going back to my criticism of the setting, if it's just violence everywhere without it ever being justified, why do I care? You know, I, I can't because it's like you're just throwing it to, for, for, for shock value, essentially, and it doesn't have as much effect. Except for when you pull, you try to get really crazy with it and start, you know, having trolls raping women. And so there's so much weird sexual violence as well, like like a horse raping Falaire. Like, it, I mean, it's, you know, it's, this is the thing is berserk. It's not just, it's, it's, it's not like, it's not gross violence, but it is sexual violence on top of just pure carnage. But yes, going back to the Eclipse. Yeah, I have nothing for praise for the way that that whole sequence of events plays out. It is, it is basically close to perfect there's almost nothing like like everything starting from the point where guts and griffith from the point where where griffith ascends in power and guts decides to leave from that moment forward everything there the, the, the entire build-up it's it's beautiful it's it's absolutely beautiful and i would i would honestly wish for it's it's just it's it's a shame again it's a shame that it's happening in something like berserk i would i would love to see something like that in um a work of fiction that's more that's generally more logical across the board because then then that that um event would have even more power when it takes place um it's it's the worst betrayal i've ever seen throughout fiction it's definitely worse than any of the shit that happens in game of thrones uh, which is saying something because you know he doesn't just betray it, it, the betrayal doesn't come from, like, supposed allies or people, you know, some other house of lords or whatever. People who have interests that don't line up with yours. No, the betrayal is very personal. It's a very personal betrayal. It's He betrays the people that, the only people that were on his side the entire way. You know, that is, that is, um, that is next level sick, you know. And that's why that kind of thing has so much power. Right. Oh God. I wanted. I wanted. There's so many things I want to say about the eclipse. I could write like I could. I could write essays about the eclipse, and it's so interesting from an ethical perspective as well. So yeah, I'm gonna say. So hold on. Let's just let's just cover the the, the build up for the to, to the eclipse for a second. So so for a long while there, all you have is, you know, you have Griffith gaining power. Um, you have guts joining Griffith. You know, you have the whole. You know, a lot of that stuff is, is, is good. It's it's not it's boring, but it's it's a slow burn. It's part of the buildup. Um, you you sort of they show how Griffith is antisocial himself in a lot of ways, and his philosophy about dreaming and, and meritocracy and all that stuff. And then, you know, at the point where they've gained where he's gained enough power, the conversation <laughs> there's the conversation between Griffith and Charlotte, right? Where he tells her about his idea that a friend is someone who's an equal who chases their own dream. And Guts hears that and decides to leave. And it's it's funny because it's um it's a misinterpretation, right? On the one well, it may it may or may not be a misinterpretation. Um, because Griffith already thinks of Guts as a friend at this point. He he's already like he loves Guts. Guts is his only friend, really. And um, Guts misinterprets that and thinks that, oh, Griffith is Griffith doesn't think of me as a friend. I have to earn his friendship. So he goes off and leaves. And Griffith doesn't like that, and he becomes ultra-depressed. He ends up sleeping with Charlotte. And then he ends up sleeping with, with Charlotte impulsively. He gets arrested as a result, tortured for two years, or a year and a half, or, or however long it is, but for a very long time. So... Then they rescue him, and the the, the scenes that follow, <laughs> where where Griffith is, where after they rescue Griffith, are just heartbreaking. Um, they're they're so sad. Like it it's sad because this this guy he had all this potential, you know, he had he he didn't even do anything that was that bad. You know, he was punished by the system. Right, the the feudal fucking you know king or whatever, you know the the, the shitty system, the si the shitty setting that they're in. Um, he didn't deserve it for sure. He for sure did not deserve it. It was it was horrible and and heartbreaking to see all of his ambition, all of his dream just crumble to dust right there. Right, the you know like what it's like one of the most heartbreaking moments is like the part when he's in the caravan and the entire group is out and they're like, what do we do now? Our, our king is essentially dead. 
You know, I mean, he can't, there's no way he can do anything. He can't talk. He can't walk. He can barely, you know, move, right? All, he's, he, he's malnourished. He's sick. He's essentially, bare, all, basically was going to die. You know, he was on his deathbed. It's over, right? And, you know, they're all sad about it and Casca's sad and everybody feels guilty about it. And they're so, you know, of course, because, because partially, you know, <laughs> it, it was, it was, Guts feels guilty because it was partially his fault, right? Because of what happened. Um, I mean, of course, technically it's none of their faults because they didn't know what would have happened. The whole thing was totally accidental, but they all feel guilty as normal people would. You know, they they didn't rescue him early enough. They they were hiding out for like a year, etc., etc. Casca feels guilty for not being attracted to Griffith anymore. Now she's with Guts, etc., etc. And then Griffith runs away. And then it's just so it's so it's so sad, you know. And then in that moment, he's like he's passed out, and he's not even thinking about his dream anymore. He's not even thinking about it. He threw his dream away. It's not even about his dream at that point. He's dreaming of just like living with Casca in a house and just, you know, some kids out, out there. And like, I found that, I found that whole sequence so like, you, you can't help, you, you can't like help but feel bad for the guy, right? You, you can't help but sympathize, right? He didn't even have his dream at that point. At that point, it was just, he just wanted to live a simple life. In that moment, he forgot it. He, I, I believe, like in that moment, he threw his. He was ready to give up his dream. He just, he was dreaming of just living a simple life, a simple life, just being married, being happy, not going for anything too ambitious, just just surviving, you know, and taking pleasure in the simple things. And that's so, it's so fucking, it's so heartbreaking because he couldn't even get that at that point. Even that was taken away from him. Even that was 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 ripped away from him in the worst possible fucking way he even couldn't that and then he's he's just sad there and about to commit suicide because what the fuck else is he supposed to do at that point you at that you're you're done you're done you have nothing left there's nothing left for you to do you can't even live the simple life and then he sees the bail it <laughs> and then things take a bit of a turn and this is why it's so fucking this is why this this whole this whole scenario is so many things at once, as Slan herself says. It's it, there's so many emotions and there's so many things going on in in that thing. Like ethically, first of all, first of all, ethically is and this is why I I think there, there's so much debate has spawned about like whether or not Griffith did anything wrong because it it's not set up in a way where you aren't sympathetic with Griffith, right? It's the, the story isn't told like. Right, the, the way Griffith's story is told is brilliant because he's not a bad guy from the beginning, at least not in any obvious way. Right, there's nothing clearly. I mean, I'm gonna get to this actually later near, near the very end of this video, but I do think there was something wrong with Griffith from the beginning. But it's not obvious what it was. He's not like Joffrey Baratheon or Ramsay Snow. He's not this mustache curling villain with evil tattooed on his forehead. That's not who he is. He's just a guy who has a dream. You know, he's he's a and he's a loser. For, for a long time. He's an underdog. That's why his story is so relatable, because you want to see him win, right? He's the underdog, you know, and he's trying to earn it. He doesn't, you know, he's not just trying to, um, he's actually working hard and doing it to try and earn his, his dream, his way. It's very engaging and sympathetic. You want to, to feel for the guy, right? And what, the way everything plays out is so sad and, and unfair and, and just brutal to, to him, right that it feels it it you know you, you can't help but feel sorry for him and of course and that's what's so sick about everything that happens because th that that's the first like the first layer of it you go into this and you're just like oh yeah i feel sad and it's heartbreaking and powerful but then it starts becoming twisted and remember that what i said earlier about the moral compass going haywire because first you start out just having sympathy right you start out you 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 get into this and you want, okay, Griffith and Guts and they're winning and yes, and then it gets into sympathy and the, the story takes this, the, the pathos goes towards the direction of, of sympathy and sadness and heartbreak and failure and tragedy. And then it starts twisting all of that, 
right? Very quickly, the story starts to twist all of that into something very, very wretched and disgusting, okay? Right before your eyes, almost seamlessly, right? Think about the nature of the choice that the God Hand give uh, any Bailiff wearer, anyone who activates a Bailiff. The Bailiff doesn't just activate for you whenever, right? They, they don't give you the, the, the choice when you're in high spirits, you know, in power, in control, you know, when you're just who you are. No, they, the choice appears when you're on your deathbed, when you've lost everything, right? That's very, that changes everything. That's what makes this choice so fucking sick, okay, is that it's not an easy choice to say no to, right? It's not. They make it that way. It's like that on purpose so that you say yes. That's what's so twisted about the, the deal that the God Hand constructed, the idea of evil, or whoever's responsible for creating the Baylets, right? It's, it's, they're, it, they're designed to bring out the worst in people. That's how they're designed, right? It's, it's basically like the way that the, the, the rule itself works, the pattern is you give a Baylet to someone, and then you make terrible after terrible thing happen to that person until they're at the point where they're ready to give up their humanity and truly give in to evil. That's how it works, and it's so twisted, and they have to give up something that's important to them in the process, right, making a very difficult choice, right, to, you know, giving up something that they actually love, something personal, committing an awful betrayal, and then becoming pure evil, right, and what's so fucking sickening about the choice is that it's not an easy choice to say no to. That's why, that's why there's so many people, I think, who, who are looking at this and actually saying, look, Griffith did nothing wrong. Right? That's why some people have that impulse, is because it's not an easy choice to say no to. It's not. Look at what Griffith went to before he got there. It's sad. It's tragic. Okay? It's not, it's not easy to look at his choice and be like, nah. You know? Everything was taken away from him. Everything was lost. It's, it's a horrible choice. I wouldn't want to make that kind of choice. Nobody would. Right? That's what's so twisted about this. <sighs> and of course... Then he makes the choice, and what follows is a brutal, horrible sequence of the, um, the, the feast, and then the rape of Casca. And I was actually, um, <laughs> I have trouble wording the emotions that I felt. I, the first time I watched this during the gore montage, I didn't know what the fuck was going on. Later, when I went through the whole story... And I, you know, I actually understood what it was that was going on. I, I had trouble, like, thinking about it afterward. This is why I was mildly depressed. Because it's, it's like, okay, the main choice that matters. Uh, so, so some people, they, they, they felt more horrified at the rape itself than, the, um, than the, the feast. I think the feast was worse than the rape. The rape itself was actually sort of very, very interesting. Like, the whole, the whole sequence is very artistically beautiful. It's like something straight out of, you know, Lovecraft's worst fucking nightmare. You know, or not, probably not Lovecraft. It's, but it's, some, it's biblical. You know, you have the, the big eclipse orb in the background and the god hand standing on the, on, on the hand, totally neutral, like, enjoying the, the view. And these just wretched mouths coming out of nowhere. The, the faces... The, the red faces everywhere, it's just, it, the, the scenery, everything is set up so beautifully to just fill your heart with real fucking despair. There is nothing but despair in that moment. You know what's going to happen. There is no hope for these people anymore. They're about to die, and they're dying, and they don't die prettily either. They get eaten, you know, they get devoured, their limbs get torn apart, they get their fucking faces squished, you know, they get swallowed whole by these fucking things, you know, some of them... Some of them, you know, the, the thing get, gets, like, infested by one, one of the guys, Corcus, I think. You know, then their bodies are used to flaunt guts. It's just, it's so awful. It's so horrible. And then the, the, <laughs> the rape itself. And I, I, I know people um, are, are more upset about the rape than the, the choice to sacrifice the hawks. Well, I, I don't know if people are more upset about that. But... I just want to say, I'm not as upset about the choice to rape Casca than the choice to... Ho the, the key choice here, right? The key, like, ethical choice that, that changed everything was the choice to sacrifice them, right? Because that's what sealed their fates. That's what did everything. And that's what unleashed the horror of the Apostles upon the Band of the Hawk. 
but that's not the the thing that I'm most concerned about. What I'm most concerned about. Sorry, that is what I'm most concerned about because what happens during the rape is he's not Griffith at that point anymore. He's Femto, and it's pretty clear that when he comes out of that cocoon, he 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 has a different psychology at that point. And I always wonder why exactly he does the rape, why he sort of uh, takes part in the spectacle. Because I don't know why Griffith doesn't seem to be like a spectac really enjoy spectacle for that for that th that much. So why does he do it? And well, the reason I assumed he did it was because um, to check if he still felt anything, right? Because I think what he realized when he was on top of the hand, when he made the choice to sacrifice the Hawks, was that feeling something for these people was what created his problem in the first place. Because he actually felt genuine care and, you know, he, he cared about guts. He cared, you know... He had some level of care and compassion for Guts, and that is what ended up destroying him, right? Right before that, it's what, you know, it's what led to him being tortured and, and led to the, you know, decline and, and his whole dream crumbling. So, you know, it makes sense that in that moment he sort of makes the choice and decision, yeah, I have to give up my humanity to actually fulfill my dream. Um, and that's what he does. So then when he comes out as Femto, he's verifying that his humanity is actually gone. He rapes her in front of Guts to check, is this going to, is I'm going to, am I going to feel anything when I do this? Because this is a horrible thing that I'm doing, supposed to be. Am I going to feel anything? And he wants to feel nothing. Because if he feels nothing, then he's free to truly pursue his dream without being encumbered by, uh, <laughs> petty morality. Yeah. So then you have, um... So and the, again, this happens again when when he and and uh, when he meets Guts during the Millennium Falcon arc. So yeah, uh, that's why I think he did the rape. That's why I'm not like the rape was obviously you know just just a horrible spectacle. But I'm not as like offended. I'm not offended isn't the right word. I'm not as horrified by it. The choice to sacrifice the Hawks. That's the real. That's the real focal point of my. Um, of, of my emotions there. I, I think going to back to what I meant about how I felt during all this. I felt truly. Like, it's like going through loss. I felt like my first thing is I was in denial. Like, I'm like, like, how could he do this? Like, how could Griffith make that choice? How could he do that to them? That's my, I'm still, that's still how I feel at this point. How could Griffith do that to them? How could he make a choice like that to treat his followers that way? After everything that they did for him. You know, and it wasn't their fault that he ended up getting arrested. After everything they did for him and they rescued him, how could he do that to them? You know, and to Guts as well, right? And I've actually, I actually, I, I get, this is a bit of my, in my in my own head canon. I don't know if, obviously, this, we don't know for sure. In my own head canon, it, it's kind of sick because the God Hand were manipulating Griffith at the same time as well. They were manipulating him. Um, with the whole thing with his image, trying to prove to him that he's been sacrificing people the whole time, right? It's it's like, I'm going to get to the ethics of that la uh, later, because that that's the thing that's like, there's, there's an ethically contentious issue there. But I do think that if Guts, if Griffith didn't immediately make the choice, if Guts maybe had like a minute or a second to just reach Griffith and talk to him, maybe he could have talked sense into him. Maybe he would have snapped him out of it. Maybe he would have made him see, look dude, you don't want to make this choice. Like, please don't make this choice. And maybe talk him out of it. And then Griffith would have said no. That, in my head canon, I think that that might have been possible. But just in that moment, Griffith himself was feeling so much uh, despair and failure and hopelessness that he had no other choice but to say yes. Right? And with the, the way the God Hand played him. The whole thing is so, so twistedly beautiful. Like, the, the way that they made it seem like he was just sacrificing people from the beginning, which he wasn't, right? He was not sacrificing from the be people from the beginning because those people agreed to help him, knowing the risks, right? They had a choice, and that choice was important, right? Um, and he did, you know, he didn't want them to get hurt in principle, right? He wasn't really friends with any of them, but he didn't want them to get hurt in principle. The difference here is that he didn't give the Band of the Hawk a choice, I mean, not at all. He just straight up did it. You know, that's part of, you know, that's part of what makes, I mean, maybe some of the band of the Hawk would have been willing to let themselves get sacrificed, you know, in theory, if Griffith would go on to build Falconia. Maybe, maybe they would. I mean, they'd have to, 
They, I, I say that in theory because it's not likely to happen. I think most people, you know, they go along with Griffith because they think that they'll be able to fulfill their dreams by helping him fulfill his. And in a, you know, in an ideal world, they would. Um, you know, the idea that some people would would be who who really believe in the cause and the idea of Falconia might be willing to sacrifice themselves, but they need to see. You know, the, they need to have the vision itself. They need to see the children playing in the streets and the people, you know, living in happiness and safety in the city's walls to be willing to do that. Griffith didn't give them that choice or, or that vision. He straight up betrayed them in you know, the worst possible betrayal. So let's, let's talk about the ethics of this. Um, like I said, it's not easy to... It's, it's, the, the choice is designed in a way where it's not easy to say no, which is part of what's sick about the choice, because the outcome of the choice is obviously horrible. Now, I want to say, the act, like, the, the event that transpired with him sacrificing the, the band, this is, this would be, like, like, from an ethical perspective, this is, like, one of the worst things that could happen. Right, and I don't mean worst and like a like a sense of like impact globally. Obviously, like people being tortured for years for for like if, if everyone's just being tortured everywhere forever, that's obviously worse. But I mean, as an individual local act, this is the worst act, you know. And this and what Griffith did is he sort of he committed the worst possible sin, which is treachery. This is why treachery is like the seventh circle of hell and shit. It's it's regarded as such a horrible thing because. The, the whole thing with treachery is that you don't see it coming, right? And the reason you don't see it coming is because, you know, you don't, is, is because you build trust from the person you don't think is going to betray you. You know, the person who, you know, engenders loyalty and, and trust and nobility and you think that they're a good person, right? If that person ends up betraying you, it's worse. See, that's the thing about it is that, while people, characters like Joffrey, you know, people who have evil tattooed on their forehead, they're not capable of what Griffith did here. They're not capable, I mean, they're capable in theory of sacrificing their troops, sure, but they're not capable of the level of treachery that's being committed. Because nobody would be that loyal to them in the first place. Nobody would believe in them, right? Nobody would because they'd see that these people are evil. They're, they're horrible. They're cruel. They don't give a fuck. Right, Griffith did give a fuck, at least somewhat, you know. So, this is the interesting, the, the sort of the weird ethical paradox here that's being presented is that it's sort of saying, and this is the thing that's that's messed that's sort of messed me up is that the the person who is capable of the most good is also capable of the worst evil, because the person who's capable of the greatest good is also is the person who's capable of committing treachery. The person who isn't capable of doing good is incapable of treachery because they're never in a position where they could commit treachery. Nobody trusts them, right? Nobody's going to follow, be loyal to Joffrey Baratheon. No one's going to, like, you, you, you're, you aren't going to trust someone like that. You're going to see it coming. No one's going to have loyalty for them, right? Th the sick thing about treachery is that you trust someone because you think they're not going to do that. Right, you have loyalty for you know your your leader because you think they're they're heavenly. You know they're an angel. They're going to do things well. They're going to make the world a better place. You know when they become king, they're going to have a great kingdom, etc. Right, and that is what gives them the power to betray you, because as soon as you start, <laughs> as soon as you start to trust them and really believe that they're you know the greatest and that they're going to you know fulfill your dreams or help you fulfill your dreams and that they're this amazing person that sets up the conditions where they now have the power to commit the worst evil right someone who's bad from the beginning would never have that power because they'd never be in a position to have that power but someone who is the best if that person can be corrupted and twisted and turned into something else they are not cap capable of the worst evil and it's the worst evil because it's a betrayal of the trust that you had for them. The whole reason you have trust for them is because you think they're not going to do that. So when they do do that, it's a violation of all of that that you've built up. All of the bonds, all of the, you know, you, you know all the information, all, all, all of the reasons that you've built up in your head and, and, and the sort of the, the assumptions and the idea that this is a person that's good, all of that gets violated in the moment they betray you. That's why treachery is 
way worse than straight up murder, you know, as an individual act, again. Right? Think about it like this, you know, what's worse, killing a random person or killing your best friend? You know, or killing someone who has helped you through multiple, you know, moments of weakness and has helped you thrive and flourish and has devoted themselves to helping your cause. What's worse, betraying a random, you know, killing a random person you don't know or killing that guy? Think about that. That's why it is an individual act. What Griffith did here is the worst fucking thing anyone could ever do. Ever. Ever. In terms of an individual act. Again, right? I'm not talking about, like, the global impact. Obviously, Griffith is not, you know, he didn't hit a button that killed, you know, millions of people or anything. No, he didn't do something that's globally bad, but locally bad. And incredibly locally bad. That that moment in the eclipse, that is, that is an individual, like, pit one of the lowest pits and valleys of, of, of sort of ethical disvalue, right? I can't think of another act that's, that's similarly as bad as what Griffith did. I can't think of one. There isn't one, right? That's why, you know, so many people really try to look at this and then go back and find reasons to hate Griffith and say, well, he's a, he's a monster from the beginning. He's a narcissist. And, we, and of course people are going to do that because you can't accept this. You can't accept that the guy who was supposed to be good from the beginning ended up committing the worst fucking evil. You can't just accept that, right? You can't accept that you couldn't see it coming. Because, and that impulse makes a lot of sense as well. Because, uh, you know, if you think about this, again, interpreting this um, um, from the perspective of ethics, ethically, you want to have a way to prevent things like the eclipse from happening. You don't want to have people in power who can who, you know, can do what Griffith does. You don't want a situation where the person that everybody loves and trusts and devotes themselves to ends up, be ends up betraying all of that. You don't want that, right? You want to avoid that as much as possible, right? So in order to do that, you need to see it coming. But if you see it coming, that person wouldn't be able to gain the power in the first place. That's the whole thing about this whole situation that's so fucking twisted, right? The eclipse wasn't anywhere on the horizon. You couldn't see it coming. Right, and that's why it, it has the impact that it has, is because you couldn't see it coming. None of the characters could see it coming, and none of the viewers could see it coming, more or less. I'm, I'm you know, exaggerating. Because you can't see because if you could see it coming, you would not trust Griffith and devote yourself to him the way you did. And this is why this is important ethically in real life, and why I think anyone who's a real ethicist should really you know, think about Berserk and examine Berserk and this, this entire narrative, because... In real life, we do choose, you know, who we follow, you know, who's going to lead society because, you know, we have leaders. We have people who make decisions, you know, on behalf of lots of other people or people who want to, you know, um, you know, gain power or, or do things or, or just, you know, build something, whatever it is. They follow their dream. It doesn't matter. The point is we follow them and we follow them based on how good of a person, partially based on how good of a person we think they are. And it's a fucking problem if the more we believe in them, the more that creates, the, the, gives them the power to betray us in the worst way. Because if we don't believe in them at all, they don't have that power because we don't have the trust in them. That trust and the bond, that's never going to be there to be betrayed. But it only is going to be there if you trust in a guy like Griffith. That's what's so fucking sick about this whole bloody situation is that, you know, it's, it's not the monster who's the obvious, you know, crazy guts monster who's just destroying and murdering people by the dozen. It's not Joffrey. It's not a psychopath. It's the guy that you thought was perfectly, you know, reasonable and, and you felt for him and you wanted him to win. It's him. It's him. He's the real villain. And some, some people ethically might say, well, this is why we shouldn't have leaders in the first place. And I would say, I actually don't want to get into that discussion because that's a complicated uh that, that's, that's a complicated discussion, but basically that's, that's not how it works. Um, you are going to have leaders so long as you have individualism. You know, you are going to have people who individually want to follow their dreams and other people who trust in them and believe in them because they think that that, you know, it's, it's like, you, you know, you, you believe in a character because you believe that their cause is just. You believe that their cause is... is worthy that they deserve it that they're earning it that it's all righteous you know and it's the righteous that can be well the the most unrighteous i guess that's what's so sick 
about this whole fucking Griffith situation is, and it's, this is, comes back to just how well Berserk is at twisting everything, because it takes something that's so, it, it takes something that's, you know, we're on his side the entire time, the entire time, more or less, up until that choice, and it's like, it's so, that's why it's so fucking weird and creepy, and if the, like, I feel violated, I feel like my empathy and, and tr compassion is violated. Because I had empathy and compassion for Griffith. I was following him. I believed in him. I wanted him to win. You know? I wanted him to become king. He seemed like he could... You know, his that his dream is something that he deserved to, uh, to get. And then, as soon as the eclipse starting, I can just feel the, the narrative threads twisting all of that against me. And making me sort of forcing this idea down my throat. Like, no, Anton. No. This is actually what's wrong. This is actually what makes Griffith a monster. And he, all of that empathy and compassion you had for him, that's all being turned against you. And that's how I feel. Like, the story is just turning against me in that moment and making everything bad. Oh, boy. <laughs> that's why it's such a powerful moment. You know, as Slanher says, you know, you got love, hate, you know, uh, good and evil, all that in that one moment where, where Griffith is uh, raping Casca. It's such a beautiful moment, narratively speaking. This story is not for the faint of heart at all because of that. And it's also not for the faint of mind. Because I think you really need to try to make sense of it. I think most people, if you look at that, and it's not easy to make sense of. It's not easy to rationalize what just happened. You know, it's like, fuck, what? What do I even believe in anymore, right? It's like, in, in a world that's fucked up as Berserk, you want to believe in the guy who wants to... You know, go for his dream, and 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 it's it's meritocratic and 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 fair. You want to believe in things like fairness, but but then it turns all that against you. What do you even believe in anymore, right? This goes back to the compass. You don't know what to believe in anymore. Now I'm saying all this with praise, but <laughs> I'm going to go backwards now and just criticize the eclipse for a little bit because there are something there. There are a few things about this that are a little weak. Um, if you really take yourself out of the story for a second and just think about it, it doesn't necessarily make sense. Like, if you think about it from the perspective of utility, why exactly is Griffith the one who even has the bailiff? Right? Like, why do the God Hand want him so badly? Okay, well, because he has the bailiff. But why does he have the bailiff? What's so useful about him? Right? Like, in terms of, you know, if, if they're worried about personal power, the problem is there's nothing really logical about why it is that's Griffith, that it's Griffith who's in that on the hand making the choice okay it could just as easily have been well i mean it's it's just it feels sort of arbitrary if you think about it like why wouldn't they want guts guts is pretty damn strong guts could be you know useful but this this is sort of like why i ask because we don't even really know what the god hand are trying to do um you know it's not obvious what anyone's really trying to do or what the idea of evil's trying to do and i know the real reason why well the real reason is because this is how the situation was constructed by the, you know the idea of evil Right, but why did the idea of evil construct it this way? Well, because this is what's desired. But why is it desired? And it's like, okay, it goes at that. At a certain point, you just have to accept it and be like, well, because this is what's desired, because this gives us, you know, a lesson about about morality and fate, and what happens when someone, you know, believes in their fate, you know, too hard or something, you know. Um, why did the idea of evil pick Griffith? Maybe it picked Griffith because Griffith was the one who was likely to make the choice. You know, and the entire situation was orchestrated in this way so that the choice would be made. Maybe that's the reason it happened. Um, I, I, I don't know. The, the point is, I'm saying it's like, this is, goes back to what I said earlier about how the logos in the story is missing because this is Animu. So if you really think about it, the logos isn't there. If the logos was there, this would make even more sense. If there was a real reason why it had to be Griffith, a logical one, and not someone else, this would have made everything, it, it would have made everything feel a lot more powerful. But then again, maybe it doesn't have to, maybe you don't need the, lo the logos just because uh, you could say, well, no, it's because of the idea of fate itself and the idea that mankind isn't in control of anything and the idea of evil is really in control of everything and it decides what happens. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> but so, so there is sort of that issue. There, there's also the issue where you think about it, like, th this, it's understandable that Griffith wouldn't, um, notice this at the time but if you think about the choice that he's being presented with okay what the god hand are offering him are 
essentially infinite power, lots of power that he wouldn't have, to repair his body, to give him all the tools that he would need to fulfill his dream as he had it, right? Um, but if you really think about it again, the very existence of the God Hand should change the nature of his dream. Like, why are you, why are you trying to become a king at this point? What does it even mean to be a king in a world where you have gods? Why wouldn't you want to become a god at that point? Do you see the issue? Like, the, the idea of the, what the god hand does should offer new possibilities to someone like Griffith. So why he's even sticking to the old dream. On top of that, this, this sort of matters as well with regards to my um, ethical analysis of it. But, you know... The idea of sacrificing your humanity could be antithetical to the dream itself. And this is actually the solution to, to how you prevent solar eclipses, uh, eclipses from happening in the real world. Is that if you have to give up your humanity to get your dream, then your dream probably isn't worth it. Because who are you without your humanity? And without your humanity, your dream is probably going to crumble into, into garbage pretty damn easily. And Griffith isn't aware of this. You know, he trusts these random demons that came out of nowhere to, to give him his dream. I mean, I get it. He's desperate. It makes enough sense. But I'm just saying, again, if you think about this, like, cold, with a, with less sort of a, a more cold, rational, you know, perspective, and just take, take yourself out of it for a minute, it, it's, um, there are good reasons not to do what, what Griffith did. And that sort of brings me to the, the comparative analysis of the rightness and wrongness of Griffith's character. Some people believe that Griffith did nothing wrong. And they genuinely believe this because uh, he created Falconia. Um, I have a criticism of that. I don't think that that's fair at all, mainly because, well, for one reason is I don't trust Falconia, obviously. Um, the other reason is that there's, there's so this, the, 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 the reason that that's a complicated argument because it sort of cuts into the difference between you know, what's ethical, what's good and bad at a local level, and what's good and bad at a global level. At a global level, you could say Griffith did a lot of good, because he saved a lot of people, he created this utopia, etc., etc. At a local level, he did a lot of bad. So then how do the local level and global level interact? Well, the way they interact is, if a person has the kind of character that Griffith does, while they can do good at the global level, that's still a problem at the global level, because this person now has power. You know, which means if something bad, if for something changes again, there's nothing stopping Griffith from sacrificing hundreds of people, thousands of people, doing whatever the fuck he likes to follow a new dream that he might have, right? The problem is, by, by committing um, the act that he did at the local level, he, proved, he, he, he basically proves himself as a very unreliable, incredibly unreliable moral character. Especially when you consider the fact that he doesn't, uh, he has no humanity or empathy anymore, right? Now, it doesn't matter how good, like, I mean, it's not that it doesn't matter. It does matter that, that the kingdom of Falconia is good, but it's still a problem that Griffith himself is evil on the inside, and it's a problem for Falconia as well. That's why Falconia is something I don't trust whatsoever, right? I mean, you do not want someone like Griffith in charge. doesn't matter, you know. <laughs> See, this is where we sort of get into a complicated argument about what exactly is the nature of his dream, right? His dream could change. His dream could mutate, right? And, and we know for a fact that because he doesn't have empathy, his dream is not concerned with the well-being of people, right? Especially the people near him. And that itself should be scary enough to... to kill the idea that, that gr everything that happened was somehow justified. That's not how ethics works. Um, the, the, again, I don't want to get too deep into the argument, but, but basically the difference between ethics at the global level and, and local level is very non-trivial. You can't just jump from one to the other, though. Like, just because something good happened at the global level doesn't mean that something bad didn't happen at the local level, and vice versa, right? Basically, the global and local level work um, parallel to one another. They don't exactly impact one another in an obvious causal way, right? So if someone did wrong at the local level, that's still wrong and that's still a problem no matter what, even if good things started happening at the global level. And if bad things happen at the global level, that's a problem no matter what, you know, even if there's good things at the local level. So you need to balance both things out. So that's why I don't like the idea that, that Griffith was completely good. But 
I will say, I think that um, the people who, who want to bash Griffith and say that he did everything wrong, there's a problem on that side of the analysis as well. Because the people who are doing that, obviously, when you look at something in the Eclipse, like I'm saying, I was fucking depressed for a week after this. Like, how could he do that? You want to find something wrong with the guy. You want to think, that wouldn't be me up there. I wouldn't have done what he did. <laughs> I wouldn't have, you know, sacrificed all my friends and, and did that. You know, most people wouldn't do that. Griffith is a special case. There's something really wrong with Griffith. You know, you know, there's something special about Griffith that he managed to do that. He was a narcissist, you know, or he was evil, or he was an anarcho-capitalist. He wanted, he's a, he wanted to be a king. That was selfish. He was selfish from the beginning. No. Um, he, there was something wrong with him, but it wasn't that. It wasn't something that obvious. That's the, that's the single problem with it. Griffith's dream, um... He's, he's at, at its core, he's just a guy with a dream. He's a guy who had a dream, and that dream ended up being totally went to shit through no fault of his own, and he had no other way out. That's very sympathetic. You can't just say there was something wrong with him because of the nature of his dream. And I know people look at that, and they're looking at it from the perspective of, well, there's something, there's something must have been wrong about his dream to begin with. No, but there's, some, there's not something wrong with his dream, right? He may, it, it, because the, the reason is, it is possible... Listen, it is possible for someone to have the same dream that Griffith did and not do what Griffith did. It is possible for someone to want to be king and to go through all the events Griffith went to and still not make the choice Griffith made. And I'll tell you the reason why. And the, the biggest reason is that it's, it's partially what it has to do with is Griffith's own perception of his own dream, right? It's about how he understands his own dream and the role of other people within it. And unfortunately, because again, this is an animu, we don't really, the characters don't go too far into this and they don't really think about the nature of their dreams. And, although partially that's true with real people as well. Real people don't always talk about, you know, think through the nature of this dream. I think about this from the perspective, if this is me and I want to have a dream, you know, and I want to be a king, I don't want to do that in a way where... Let's say I've accepted the feudal system as, as you know, the, the political system that we're having. Why not? Just for argument's sake, because I don't want to get into a political argument here. Let's say I've accepted that. Um, if I want to be a king, there is such a thing as a righteous king. There is such a thing as a good king. That's why when we look at things like, you know, Game of Thrones, we do root for characters like Jon Snow. Not because we think they would be good kings, insofar as kings can be good. And that's the thing. A king can be good. Right? Just because something might be wrong with feudalism doesn't mean every king is evil. You know, a king can be good. That's not the problem with feudalism. The problem with feudalism is that if a king isn't good, you have no way to course correct. The king has power, and if he's not good, he could easily abuse that power. Right? If a king is always good and perfectly good, bravo. By all means. You know, do it. it it's fine. No, nobody loses anything. You know, and if you want to become a king, you could always you go make your own kingdom. That works as well. Uh, well... I'm, I'm simplifying that, but maybe, right? That's the thing, is that the, the standards for, for being good are very high when you have so much power, right? And if this were me, and I want a dream, and I have all these people lining up to help me, I want the dream to be about them as well, right? I want a, the dream to be pro-social, right? I want them to be involved in it. I want the dream to be theirs as well as mine, or the vision, right, that I have to also be theirs. You know, I want them to be there, right, at the gates of my kingdom when I build it. I want them to be there with me as I triumph, right? I don't want to be there alone. I don't want to just, you know, not, I, I don't want to not be there without them, right? Especially when they've done all this work to help me, right? See, the thing is, the moral, the, the right thing to, to happen would have been if Griffith realized at the top of the hand that sacrificing the hawks would have been deeply antithetical to the dream itself yes he could still have his city and be a king but he wouldn't be able to do it with all of these people who helped him you know the dream would be antisocial right it wouldn't be entangled with their dreams and this goes back Right, this is very important, by the way. It's very important. This goes back to what Griffith said when he talked about friendship and how nobody's really his friend. He didn't think of those people as equals in any way at all. Not even close, right? They were beneath him. And not just in, the, in, the, not just in, in 
like, you know, different status. Because Griffin didn't care so much about status. They were beneath him in the, the philosophy of dreaming itself. He didn't believe that they had their own dreams, right? That's what's actually kind of messed up about this. Because he explains that his whole philosophy about things is that if you have a dream, you need to follow it. And the person who's my friend is equal to me is someone who follows their own dream, right? And that's funny that he only really considered Guts to be his friend. Guts, who a guy was not following his own dream at the time at all. It make it's a very... Do you see the problem? Like, it's a very weird philosophy that Griffith actually has, considering the fact that everybody on his... in the Band of the Hawks was following their dream, except for Guts. Guts was the only guy who wasn't. Guts was the only guy who didn't know what the fuck he was, and where he was, and why he was doing anything. And Gr that's the one guy Griffith actually felt equal to. He didn't feel equal to anybody else, though, even though everybody else was following their dreams. They just believed that their dreams was, were entangled with Griffith's. Their belief was, I could accomplish my dream if I helped Griffith accomplish his. That's what they believed. That's how they felt about it. But Griffith never understood that. And this is my real criticism of Griffith's character, because I do think there was something wrong with him. Right? What was wrong with him is his idea of the dream was antisocial. Right? He didn't ever really understand how dreams themselves worked. He never understood how other people's dreams worked. Other people weren't with him just because. They were with him because they had their own dreams, you know, and their dreams were entangled with his. He never understood or respected that, right? And I would say maybe he would, had the potential to understand and respect that. I'm not saying he didn't. But at the time and in the moment of the eclipse and, you know, he... he he didn't know or really get that this was their dream as well because they'd invested themselves so much they risked their lives you know they'd done all this stuff they helped him this was no longer just his dream this was their dream as well and he had no right to violate that bond in that way right he should have realized in that moment, in fact, and it, it, it's the kind of, it, it's a very strong ethical rule too, because if he did violate that bond, if he did violate the fact that it's their dream as well, that should have killed the dream, right? And then what he should have realized at the top of the hand was that making the choice to sacrifice them was antithetical to the dream itself. This is why I mentioned earlier how it would have been different if they made the choice to sacrifice themselves. Because I do believe that's possible, right? The idea of self-sacrifice. I'm enamored by the idea of self-sacrifice, you know. And if, like, if I have the same vision as this Griffith guy and I want to see this splendid, you know, kingdom come to life, sure, I might do that. I might consider getting myself eaten by, well, maybe I'll slip my own throat because I don't want to be eaten by, you know, fucking asshole demon over there. But I'm, you know, I'm willing to shed blood shed my blood to make that happen but i have to be certain i have to be confident that that's what's being fought for here in that moment what we find out is that griffith's dream really never converged with theirs or it completely diverged they were tools and he was sort of tricked into thinking that they were tools because he never really understood that their dreams were his dream as well okay he never he never had that figured out. And this is proven in the fact that he doesn't understand that Guts is the guy who doesn't have a dream. Right? Guts is the guy who, by his own logic, by Griffith's logic, has the least reason to be with Griffith. Because he was with Griffith because of Griffith's dream, not his own. Right? And that's where the reason Guts leaves. Because Guts looks at this as like, Griffith has a dream, all these people have dreams. See, this is the way Guts understood it. He's, Guts thought that Griffith was friends with all those people, that, he, that they understood another, and he was the guy who felt like he was the odd one out. Right? That's why he left. And he was right. Because that actually makes sense. They, their dreams do make sense. Griffith has his dream, they have theirs, their dreams are entangled, etc. But, and he, Guts, Guts is the odd one out, so he has to leave and, and find... You know, out who he is and self-actualize and then maybe come back right but griffith griffith never understood that okay griffith didn't understand that the band of the hawks dreams were entangled with his own um he never even considered that i i, I would say he never even really understood that they had dreams to begin with he was completely alienated from them right that's probably why he never even thought they're friends now i understand that the issue with like if you're a leader you don't necessarily want to just be friends with all your subordinates. This is a real problem in, like, this This would create a real problem throughout, you know, in real organizations. This is true in, like, uh, you know, Captain Picard in Star Trek. You can't just fraternize with, you know, 
the employees, you know, the, the, the people who are, you know, all the foot soldiers, because you still, you have to hold yourself to a slightly different standard, right? They have to see you as a leader. They have to sort of, you know, um, be confident in you and be willing to follow your orders. You can't just play along and, and let them have their way no matter what. You have to be, you have to set certain boundaries, and those boundaries are important in real life as well. That's certainly true. But <clears throat> the issue here isn't even the boundaries. The issue is that I don't think Griffith could ever really put himself in their shoes. That's the thing, right? The difference is you do want a leader who sets those boundaries but could still put himself in the shoes of his subordinates. Think about what it would be like to not be the leader, to be the guy trying to pursue your dream by pursuing this other guy, by helping this other guy pursue his dream. Griffith needed to be able to do that. A good leader would have been able to do that, right? Griffith never, I don't think he ever really did that or understood how to do that, right? He never really empathized with them, you know, on the level of the dream itself. He didn't want them to get hurt. Let's be clear about that. He didn't want them to just die, right? And he, you know, he needed them to make a choice, right, to uh, follow him. Not, not just, you know, he wouldn't just, he, he wouldn't just callously and easily say, yes, kill yourself for me. But he never respected the fact that they had their own dreams whilst following his. And if he was really, you know, if he really believed his own philosophy that a person should follow their dreams, what right would he have to stop these other people from pursuing their dreams? He, what he should have done is realize in that moment that, look, fate has dealt me a bad hand. I have, I have failed. This is a, you know, a, a tragedy. I can't win anymore. But I cannot violate their dreams to pursue mine. Because if I do, in, and I violate it in that way, I destroy my own dream. Because my dream is not a dream to fulfill something and, and have a kingdom where, with where that kind of thing is okay. My dream is to have a kingdom and be a king of, in a kingdom where that kind of thing doesn't happen. You know, a kingdom where things are fair. That would have been my dream. That's how Griffith should have been thinking. He should have been, you know, if his dream was really about fairness, if that was part of it, he would have never done this. Or at the very least, this, you know, he would have had very strong reasons not to sacrifice the Hawks. Because you can't, because choosing to sacrifice, you know, their dreams for the sake of his in that way would have killed his own dream. Because now his dream is no longer fair, right? As soon as you do that, the dream is no longer about fairness. It's about being selfish. And you can't do that. Again, it's not their fault that, you know, what happened to him happened. Maybe it is that they could have been slightly different. Maybe they would have been smarter. Maybe they could have, you know, done things differently. And they do feel guilty about that. The Band of the Hawks, they all regret what happened. Every single one of them, right? They're all very sad about it, especially Casca, who, who, you know, most of the responsibility was hers, right? He had no right to do that to them, right? They did their best, you know? They did their best in this situation, right? It would be different if he's sacrificing, you know, the king of Wyndham or whatever. Yeah, fuck, fuck that guy, right? He, he's, he, he put him in this situation. Nobody would give a shit if Griffith did that. No, but these people, they did their best. You don't get to shit on their dreams that way. And more evidence um, proving what I, my theory about Griffith here. Pay attention to what Griffith says when Guts decides to leave. He doesn't want to talk about it. He doesn't want to discuss it. He doesn't want to try to understand. He doesn't understand it at all. He doesn't get it. Why is Griffith leaving me? Why is he doing this to me? How dare he does this? His life is forfeit. Think about how quickly Griffith jumps to that solution. His life is forfeit. This is your best friend here. And he's so offended at the idea of, of Guts leaving him like that, that he's willing to do that. Right? That's very messed up. Especially when you think about what Guts is really doing. He's an autonomous human being trying to pursue his own dream. Again, if you're Griffith and you really believe in this philosophy that people need to pursue their dreams, and you want them to, because you want them to be able to do that. You don't want to be in a world where no one pursues their dreams. Remember, Griffith doesn't even respect the people who don't pursue their dreams. Yet, yet, by his own actions, he benefits from people who don't seem to pursue their own dreams. Because, it, think about it, if he believes that all of the band of the hawk if he, or, and guts aren't pursuing their own dreams, if he really believes that, 
you know, if he doesn't get it, if he doesn't understand that they're trying to pursue their dreams by helping him, <clears throat> where was I going with this? Um, if he doesn't get it, that they're trying to pursue their dreams by helping him, then he should be, like, it, it doesn't make, it, it makes him very parasitic that he's taking advantage of people he disapproves of, basically. Like, if he doesn't approve of them because they don't have a dream, he's he's taking advantage of people he disapproves of, right? They're essen he essentially thinks they're all beneath him because they're not pursuing their dreams, but he benefits from them being beneath him. So his dream is is a dream that's that's another that's another point of logic I'm throwing in there to show how his dream is antisocial or his philosophy about things is antisocial because if his if his idea about dreaming if if dreaming if having a dream is so important and um you want other people to have their own dreams and you respect the people who do then how is it that most of the people in the world and surrounding you don't do that and you don't respect them and yet you benefit from them being beneath you? It's very fucking convenient, right? And it's very bizarre that you would want to surround yourself by people who you don't respect. That's messed up. You don't want to do that. You don't want that in a good leader. You want the leader who surrounds himself with people that he does respect. And again, like I'm saying, like it's not that Griffith never felt guilt at all. He had some of the potential of a leader, obviously, but not all of it. Because he doesn't seem to understand why other people are doing anything, right? He doesn't get that Guts doesn't have a dream. And that he's going out there because he's trying to pursue his dream. And Griffith doesn't even care. They don't even talk about it. It's so weird, strange. They could have talked that, all, uh, that out. They could have thought about it. Guts could have explained things to him. Griffith could have maybe argued whatever. But think about this. If this is you... You know, and this is someone who, you know, Guts is your friend and he's, he really, you know, and you think of him as your friend and he's out to pursue his own dream. What right do you have to stop him? You have no right to stop him, right? This is what he's supposed to do. And by your own admission, it's what he's supposed to do because this is what is requisite for him having your respect, right? He wants to have your respect. That's why he's doing it, motherfucker. Why do you think he's doing it? He's doing it for you, you fuck. And you're shitting on it. That's why it's it, that that moment there when Griffith plans to um, kill Guts when Guts is leaving. His life is forfeit to me because he's leaving. That is the first red flag that there's something fucked up about the way this guy thinks. So there is something messed up about him. It's just nothing so obvious and, and, and obvious. He's not obviously selfish. He's not obviously cruel or, or psychotic or sadistic or anything like that. He's just a guy with a dream, but, but... His philosophy about dreaming is very antisocial. He doesn't understand why other people dream. He doesn't seem to recognize when other people do have dreams because he doesn't respect all his followers even though they all have a dream and their dream is entangled with his, you know. And for, for some reason, they don't res seem to recognize that he doesn't respect them <clears throat> on that level. Probably because Griffith is so private and so good at hiding it. That's probably why they don't recognize it. And he doesn't even recognize when his best friend, the only guy who he actually cares about, is trying to, you know, follow his own dream to gain your favor. You know, to gain his favor, his Griffith's, you know, respect and to be thought of as an equal. He should have been flattered at, at least, but he just doesn't get it. That's what I'm, that's my whole thing with Griffith. And I'm pretty confident in this interpretation of it. He's not someone who's inherently bad, but he just never understood uh, his dream or the purpose of his dream to others or how his dream had to relate to others. And to bring this back to the whole ethics discussion, this is why it's so important for the dreamers out there, the, the people who have dreams that they want to pursue, to have dreams that are pro-social, to have dreams that are in some way married to some kind of pro-social concept like fairness or goodness or, or value, something like that. It's no clear, there's no clear indication that Griffith was married to that. His dream was just to be king. And who knows what his dream would have turned into if he succeeded to just become king. Maybe, you know, without the eclipse happening, maybe he would have become king. And then maybe after he became king, his dream would have turned into maintaining his dynasty and keeping a grips on that and his legacy. And then maybe he would have somehow turned into a Tywin Lannister type character. I couldn't see that happening. And it's not even because he's a bad person. 
It's because he just doesn't seem to understand what other what's in it for everyone else. You know, what's in it for others has to be part of what's in it for you. It had can't just be about you. It has to be about them as well. Because if it's about them and about you at the same time, if it's about all of you, it's from. How do I phrase this? In a, in a, in a clever way. If what's about you is also about them, then it's doubly about you and about them. Okay? The amount of value that will be created if you play the game fairly, if you do it for, you know, for them, for the system, as well as for yourself, both of those things will be amplified. I want, that's what I believe. Right? I want to believe in that concept. That the person whose dream is truly righteous, truly righteous, will end up reaching the greatest of heights. As far as personal personal um, achievement and success and self actualization, because their dream was the most righteous, you know, and their reward is highest as a result because their dream was the most righteous, and their dream is righteous because it's not just about who they are, right? The whole situation with doing what Griffith did that would have been antithetical to his dream because that would have been cheating because he's not playing fair to get it at that point. He's sacrificing people who aren't at fault. You know, for what ended up happening, and he's not that. At that point, you're not playing fair. And if, and if your dream is one that you achieve without playing fair, then, well, then you don't deserve to have it, do you? Especially when it's that unfair. So yeah, that's how um, that's how I'm wanting to uh, to analyze this situation. In the future, what this show should teach every single fucking person who, who really wanted to take the message seriously is to really be critical of the dream that another person has. Someone who's personally driven to achieve something. It's not wrong to be driven to achieve something, even if it's something like being a king, right? It's wrong when in, in the way you go about it could be wrong. The way Griffith went about it was, was it wasn't even entirely wrong, but it was flawed. Okay, it was antisocial, and that antisocialness in it, which I don't even I don't even think that it was about him being, you know, cruel or mean or or lacking, um, not having the ability to sympathize. It was that he just didn't understand. He didn't get it, and nobody explained it to him. Nobody could explain it to him, right? He was never worried about 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 having that kind of spiritual guidance either. He didn't ask for anyone's advice. He just did what he thought was right, you know. You want dreamers who understand that their dreams need to be pro-social. need to have a pro-social attitude towards your own dreams. A pro-social process, you know, has to be in there somewhere. That's the lesson that I take. And that's my... That's my analysis of it, and um, hopefully that is that is the analysis that can help that can help people fulfill their dreams yet and simultaneously prevent eclipse like situations from happening and uh, now I have to go and think about watch the fucking Disney movie or something because I really one of the reasons I delayed this whole thing is I really didn't want to think about this. You know, because the eclipse is something so nasty that, yeah. But the moment is past, and um, I hope you all enjoyed this video. Please let me know what you think. Cheers.